Thank you. So if you look around you, and apart from yourself, what is not a product of human creativity? And where would you be, and what would you do if you didn't have creativity to help you navigate through life? Defined as the ability to generate uh, ideas and products that are at the same time both novel and meaningful, creativity is extremely important to the individual and to society. Uh, yet it is an ability that we know relatively little about in terms of what makes us creative. If we knew more about the neural mechanisms of creativity, uh, we would have better possibilities to develop this talent or this ability, to educate ourselves and to design our environment as to maximize creativity, both on the individual and on the group level. Research so far tells us that creativity is an extremely complex phenomenon. It stems from a rare uh, combination of personal traits and cognitive abilities, a complex interaction between genes and environment. And if we look at the brain, it's not very simple either. There does not seem to be one particular region which is sort of the creative region, and if we stimulate that, we're all geniuses. That's not the case. And I would like to illustrate that point by showing some findings from studies that we have done on professional musicians. We had them come to us, well, we asked them, and uh, we had them play piano in a uh, MR scanner so that we could look at their brain activity while playing. And we compared musical improvisation to just pressing keys randomly. And we saw nothing that was unique to musical improvisation, which is quite remarkable. Instead, we saw a network of regions in the frontal portion of the brain that was predominantly active for both these tasks. And to illustrate this further, uh, here you see on top a slice of brain looking from the top, quite high up. And here you see different experimental conditions where they improvise melody, they improvise rhythm, and they do free improvisations. And they also do sight reading. So they play from a musical score. And you can see that under the improvisation conditions, activity in these regions is higher. But it's not zero when they're doing sight reading. So it seems that these regions are active when, uh, when uh, your actions are guided by external cues and also when you are internally generating these musical structures. So this leads us to believe that domain-specific regions can switch modes of function. When there is not enough information in the environment to guide actions, these regions can, based on your stored expertise, switch modes of function and generate, in, the, in this case, novel and meaningful musical sequences. And this is a quite new perspective on how creativity works in the brain. So this is an example of what we see when we look at a group of high creative individuals and try to see what's common in between them. We've also used another approach where we look at individual differences in creativity because people are creative to different degrees. And by uh, correlating individual differences in creativity with individual differences in their brains, we're able to say something about the processes and mechanisms that are involved. But how do we measure creativity? Uh, this is an example or an illustration of a divergent thinking test. All divergent thinking tests um, <clears throat> involve generating a multitude of responses to open-ended questions. So in this case, you're given a circle and you're supposed to complete it into various pictures. And you can measure how many responses a person makes within a given time 
and how able you are to switch in between different categories of responses. You can look at association width. And what's interesting about these tests is that they predict real life creative achievement. And they do so more than intelligence tests. So that's why these types of tests are, are widely used. We thought that creativity might be related to the dopamine system. Now, dopamine is a neurotransmitter in the brain which regulates communication between nerve cells. And its action will depend a little bit on how, um, on what type of receptors are on these communicating neurons. So dopamine may increase activity or decrease activity depending on receptors, dopamine receptors. Dopamine is involved in various aspects of cognition and it's also involved in creativity. As was shown in a study in which uh, one could see that people who scored higher in divergent thinking tests uh, were carriers of a certain allele of a D2 receptor gene. And we know that genetic variations in this gene uh, is related to differences in uh, dopamine D2 receptor density in the brain. So we thought that, okay, maybe divergent thinking is related to uh, individual differences in dopamine D2 receptor density in different regions of the brain. So we had a group of healthy subjects come to us. They did a, a divergent thinking test and we scanned them using positron emission tomography to look at D2 receptor density. And we found that those individuals who scored higher on the divergent thinking test also had lower levels of dopamine D2 receptor density in a region called the thalamus, which is here at the center of the brain. You see the outline of the brain, this is from the side, and this is right in the center. Uh, thalamus is described uh, as a relay station in the brain. Sensory information comes into the brain and is distributed to various regions. It's also important for upholding uh, communication between uh, regions that are far apart. And we know that this is important for creative thinking. So this lower density of D2 receptors, what does it do? Well, it will affect information flow. So to reduce filtering of information, and it will affect the distribution of information across the brain. So more information will be let through, and perhaps unexpected information will be let through. And this may facilitate divergent thinking. So to increase fluency, increase cognitive flexibility, and also give a greater association width. Interesting is also that this might explain a curious link uh, that exists between creativity and mental illness, which we will hear the next speaker talk about more. What is typically found in patients with schizophrenia, uh, it's a consistent finding, is that they have lower levels of D2 receptor density in the thalamus. Now in this case, it's believed that this state leads to an excess of information and a dysregulation of the information flow. So you, you have disorganized thought processes, possibly hallucinations as well. So the relation here between creativity and, and mental illness might be that uh, thinking out of the box is to some extent facilitated by having a less intact box. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> 